This is the fourth lecture in a planned series of five lectures on the land battles of Guadalcanal. I concluded the last lecture with the Japanese defeats at the battles of Bloody Ridge and the Battle of Henderson Field, also known as the Battle of Coffin Corner. I will continue this lecture series with the major battles over control of the mouth of the Matanacau River, the Battle of Coley Point, Carlson's Long Patrol, and the Battle of the Gifu. There were five battles fought along the Matanacau River. These battles were initiated by the Marines to drive the Japanese away from the perimeter. I will describe Matanacau two and three, the two biggest battles fought for control of this important barrier. During the early part of the Battle of Guadalcanal, the Matanacau was the dividing line between the Japanese and Marine forces. Histories of the campaign have focused more on the other battles, such as the Teneru, Bloody Ridge, and Coffin Corner, so they are better known, but the fighting around the Matanacau was more sustained and there were more casualties during the battles that were fought here. From August to December 1942, the river delineated the front line. Both sides at times pushed across the Matanacau and then withdrew. The Japanese held the west bank and the Marines the east bank. Both sides of the river were close enough for each side to hear the other. Profane taunts were flung back and forth. There was a bridge across the river at the base of Hill 67 called Ipan Bashi by the Japanese and one log bridge by the Marines. It was simply a tree trunk that had fallen across the river. This is a contemporary view of the mouth of the Matanacau looking south. Although not a particularly imposing river, it was deep enough that the sand spit at the mouth was the only place where heavy weapons such as tanks and artillery could cross. For that reason, it was recognized by the Americans as a key terrain feature that had to be defended. Both sides dug in and defended the banks. General Vandegrift's goal was to push the initial perimeter west to the Matanacau. He wanted to establish a permanent position on the east bank of the Matanacau. Domination of the mouth of the river was essential to the defense of Henderson Field. The rough terrain and thick jungle around the river effectively prevented heavy equipment from crossing the river at any point except over the sand spit at the mouth. Since tanks, trucks, and artillery pieces could cross the river over the sand spit, the Japanese, had they been able to emplace artillery on the east bank, might have threatened Henderson more than they did in October. Two Marine infantry battalions were assigned to hold the Matanacau. They established a horseshoe-shaped position running from the mouth along the east bank to a point 2,000 yards inland. They refused the right flank along the beach and the left flank east along the ridge line to Hill 67. The Japanese were also eager to establish a position on the east bank at the mouth of the Matanacau. They made their first probe on October 20th with two tanks moving across the sand spit. Marines firing a 37mm anti-tank gun destroyed one and forced the other to retreat with its accompanying infantry. On October 23rd, nine more Japanese tanks supported by a large infantry force tried to force their way across the sand spit. The Marines were waiting and ready. Artillery ranged from the perimeter, 81mm mortars, the 75mm half-track, and the 37mm anti-tank gun destroyed all the tanks and killed hundreds of Japanese infantry. The Marines lost 25 KIA and 14 wounded during this night engagement. This is one of the destroyed Japanese tanks on the sand spit at the mouth of the Matanacau. The Japanese crossed upriver on the night of September 26th and set up a bivouac. That same day, the Marines hit the Japanese in a three-pronged attack across the Matanacau. It was a hastily improvised plan and did not go well. The goal was to continue the momentum obtained from the wind at Bloody Ridge and clear out the Japanese from the Point Cruz area. Chesty Polar 7th Marines set out from the perimeter on September 23rd toward Mount Austin, 1,600 yards upriver. On September 27th, they encountered and surprised the Japanese, 
who had crossed the river the day before using the only bridge across the river, the one log bridge. A brief firefight ensued before the Marines continued north toward the river mouth. Two companies of the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines accompanied the wounded back to the perimeter. The 1st Raider Battalion was ordered to join Puller at the mouth of the Matanikau, cross the river at the One Log Bridge, and attack the Japanese at the Matanikau village. At the One Log Bridge they came under fire and Major Ken Bailey was killed by machine gun fire. Three companies of the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, were ordered to make an amphibious landing just west of Point Cruz to attack the Japanese from the rear. After disembarking, the Marines took off for Hill 84. At the mouth of the river, the 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, attempted an assault across the sand spit. Fierce Japanese resistance on the west side prevented the Marines from getting across. By now it was clear that both attacks across the river had failed there would be no joint action. 1st Battalion, 7th Marines was on its own and in trouble. The Japanese cut them off from the beach. They were surrounded. The original mission was now impossible and getting out of an increasingly desperate situation was now the objective. The mission was so hastily thrown together that the Marines forgot to bring a radio and therefore could not report their situation to get assistance. Captain Kelly of the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, 1-7, ordered his men to take off their shirts and arrange them on the hillside so that they spelled out, Help! An SBD piloted by Lieutenant Dale Leslie saw the help message and radioed the news to the Marine Command Post back at the Lunga perimeter. The destroyer USS Ballard was urgently dispatched to help. Getting as close to the shore as she could, she used her signal lamp to communicate with 1-7, who used semaphore flags. Using this form of communication, 1-7 organized the Ballard's guns to blast a passage for the Marines to fight their way to the evacuation beach. Coast Guardsman, Signalman, First Class Douglas Monroe, in the meantime, rounded up a flotilla of 12 landing craft to go back to extricate the Marines. His task was to supervise the evacuation and using his Lewis machine gun to provide fire support for the other boats. Lieutenant Leslie, who had spotted the help message, used his plane to guide the flotilla of boats to the correct evacuation beach just west of Point Cruz. He used his 50 caliber machine gun in ground attacks against the Japanese. For this, he was awarded the Navy Cross. Ironically, Lieutenant Leslie was shot down the next day in the western part of Guadalcanal behind enemy lines. Fortunately, he was picked up by Australian coast watchers and spent some time with them before being returned to the perimeter. What would have happened had he been shot down the day before and not the day after? The 7th Marines might have suffered complete annihilation if Dale Leslie had not noticed the help message. Such is the caprice of war. Doug Monroe provided covering fire for the Marines as they waded out to his boat. The other gunner in the boat saw a line of enemy machine gun bullets splashing across the water. He called out to Monroe, but the engine noise was too loud for Monroe to hear him. The bullets walked their way toward the boat and hit Monroe in the head. As the gunner tended to the wounded Monroe, his last thoughts were still with his duty. His last words before he died were, Did we get them off? Colonel Puller, the Marine officer who had ordered the attack in which Monroe was killed, nominated the Coast Guardsman for the Medal of Honor. At the age of 22, Monroe became the only member of the United States Coast Guard ever to be awarded the Medal of Honor. I would like to read his Medal of Honor citation. For extraordinary heroism and conspicuous gallantry in action above and beyond the call of duty as officer in charge of a group of Higgins boats engaged in the evacuation of a battalion of Marines trapped by enemy Japanese forces at Point Cruz, Guadalcanal, on September 27, 1942. After making preliminary plans for the evacuation of nearly 500 beleaguered Marines, Monroe, under constant risk of his life, daringly led five of his small craft toward the shore. 
As they closed the beach, he signaled the others to land, and then in order to draw the enemy's fire and protect the heavily loaded boats, he valiantly placed his craft with its two small guns as a shield between the beachhead and the Japanese. When the perilous task of evacuation was nearly completed, Monroe was killed by enemy fire, but his crew, two of whom were wounded, carried on until the last boat had loaded and cleared the beach. By his outstanding leadership, expert planning, and dauntless devotion to duty, he and his courageous comrades undoubtedly saved the lives of many who otherwise would have perished. He gallantly gave up his life in defense of his country. Doug Monroe was buried with honors in his home state of Washington. Semper Paratus, Doug Monroe. In the third battle around the Matanikau, the Japanese established a position on the east bank of the river. In early October, the Tokyo Express delivered troops to Guadalcanal, well west of the river from the 2nd Infantry Division, in preparation for their planned major offensive in late October, what would become the Battle of Henderson Field. They deployed the three battalions of the 4th Infantry Regiment along the west side of the Matanikau, south of Point Cruz, with 3rd Company placed on the east side of the river. They were to assist in preparing positions from which heavy artillery could reach Henderson Field. This was the Japanese plan. The Marine Command discovered Japanese concentrations between western Guadalcanal and the Matanikau and what looked like preparations for an offensive. Vandegrift chose to strike first with the objective of seizing Kokombona and driving the Japanese beyond the Poho River, well to the west. The Marine operational plan called for the 5th Marines to advance along the coast to the Matanikau and prepare to cross on orders. Two battalions of the 7th Marines and the 3rd Battalion 2nd Marines, called the Whaling Group, advanced to the east bank of the river about 400 yards from the river mouth. The Whaling Group, 3-2, and the two battalions of the 7th Marines would cross the Matanikau and advance to Brest on successive ridges and then wheel north to trap the Japanese. The Japanese were caught off guard and were not aware of the Marine offensive until it started. The Marines hoped this maneuver would trap large Japanese forces around the Matanikau and, if successful, the 5th Marines would pass through and advance to Kokombona. Here, the contemporary town of Haniara is superimposed over the map to show where today's bridge over the Matanikau is located in relation to the Japanese position on the east bank of the river in 1942. When we drive over this bridge on our tour, we will drive right over the spot where Japanese C Company of the 4th Infantry was dug in. On the far left, Polar's 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, moved down the crest of the ridge. They looked down to their left and saw a battalion of Japanese of the 4th Infantry in a wooded ravine. The Japanese were at the bottom of the ravine filling their canteens and were caught completely by surprise. The Marines immediately took the Japanese under fire with small arms. Polar called in an artillery mission and also added the fire of his mortars to create a machine of extermination, as he later reported. The Japanese attempted to escape by climbing the opposite slope of the ravine, but as they ran up the barren hillside, direct machine gun and rifle fire raked them, and the survivors retreated into the ravine until the shelling drove them to repeat the attempt with the same results. Only after expending his mortar ammunition did Pulrock's call for a cease fire and withdrew down to the coast at the Matanikau as had the other two battalions to his right. This is a view of the ravine today with 1-7 veteran platoon sergeant Stan McLeod and John Ennis, the late Guadalcanal historian. The Marines suffered 65 KIA and 125 wounded during the three-day operation. The Japanese suffered the loss of nearly 700 KIA. It was another disastrous defeat for the Japanese. This is another view of the ravine today from where the Marines took the Japanese under fire. The creek at the bottom of the ravine today is obscured by the vegetation. 
I would now like to briefly describe the exploits of the 2nd Raider Battalion at Guadalcanal under the command of Colonel Evans Carlson. This is a team photo of Carlson, circled in red, and the 2nd Raider Battalion after what came to be known as the Long Patrol that took place from November 4th to December 4th, 1942. But first a little background leading to Carlson's Long Patrol. One of the Japanese battalions involved in the failed attempt to breach the Marine lines during the Battle of Henderson Field, or Coffin Corner, was the 1st Battalion of the 203rd Regiment under the command of Colonel Toshinari Soji. It is not clear from the history of the battle if 1-230 even made contact with the Marines at Coffin Corner. In any event, after the battle, 1-230 retreated to the east. In one of the freakish parts of the battle, however, it was reported to Japanese Division Headquarters that Soji's men had penetrated the Marine lines and occupied the grassy clearing east of the airfield. By November 4th, Soji's men had reached Koli Point, where they found 131 fever-riddled survivors of Ichiki's and Kawaguchi's previous efforts. They bivouacked on a large grassy clearing. From intercepted radio intelligence, General Vandegrift was alerted to this move. By November 8th, Soji's regiment and reinforcements had dug in along the Kavagago Creek near Tateri, about a mile east of the Metapona River. Based on the intercepted Japanese radio message, General Vandegrift ordered the 2nd Battalion 164th Regiment and the 7th Marines to surround Soji's men where they eventually were bottled up in a pocket at the mouth of the creek. There was a hole on the southern side of the pocket that Marines were unable to fill, leaving a potential avenue of escape for the Japanese. G Company of the 164th finally closed the hole, but not before most of Soji's men escaped and began heading west. The systematic extermination of the remnants in the pocket by 150 and 75 mm howitzers extended into November 12th. American reports show 450 Japanese dead lay in the positions. American losses were 40 KIA and 120 wounded in what came to be called the Battle of Coley Point. Now, a little bit about Colonel Carlson and the Raiders. Carlson was considered by many within the Marine Corps to be a maverick with questionable ideas. He had the ear, however, of President Roosevelt, who gave his consent to allow Carlson to develop the Marine Raiders. Eventually, four Raider battalions were formed. We have already heard about the 1st Raider Battalion under the command of Colonel Edson and their considerable contribution to the battles at Tulagi and Bloody Ridge. By 1944, the four Raider Battalions had been disbanded and reformed into the 4th Marine Regiment. Colonel Carlson lived only two years after the end of the war, passing away at the age of 51 in 1947. Colonel Soji slipped away to the west with about 3,000 hungry and exhausted men to begin a trek to rejoin the 17th Army west of the Matanikau. Colonel Carlson and his 2nd Raiders set off from Aola Bay in hot pursuit. For all practical purposes, Soji and Carlson disappeared into the deep jungle to fight their own campaign for a month. With the aid of invaluable Solomon scouts, including the aforementioned Jacob Fuza, the Raider Battalion kept pace with Soji's column, repeatedly falling on its trailing elements and stragglers. At the end of his expedition west across the Lunga River on December 5th, Carlson reported killing 488 Japanese at a cost of 16 Raiders killed and 18 wounded. Here are two photos of Carlson's raiders fording a stream and hiking up a grassy hill. No less than Admiral Nimitz awarded Colonel Carlson a gold star to add to his Navy Cross for his accomplishments on the long patrol. 
As early as October 1942, the Japanese began reconnoitering the area on the heights of Mount Austin for a position from which to keep an eye on the Marines within the perimeter. Engineers who prepared the defensive position were from the Gifu Prefecture in Japan and so named the position the Gifu. In November, a composite battalion of Japanese made up of elements from the 124th and the 228th Infantry occupied and dug into prepared positions known as the Gifu. It was a static defensive position well protected by coconut logs up to five logs deep that supported interlocking fields of fire from protected foxholes. This is an example of a camouflage bunker at the Gifu. The 1st and 3rd Battalions of the U.S. Army's 132nd Infantry of the Americal Division began the reduction of the Gifu by attacking the northern-facing Japanese defenses. These initial attacks failed to make any headway due to stronger-than-expected resistance. On December 19th, Colonel William Wright of the 3rd Battalion went forward with the attack and was throwing hand grenades at a Japanese machine gun position when he was mortally wounded and soon died of his wounds. The road built by the Army to move supplies and vehicles up to the battle area to support the attack on the Gifu was named the Wright Road in his memory. The Wright Road, looking north, was used by the U.S. Army to bring supplies, vehicles, and men to the battle area. Today, Hill 35 is the site of the Japanese memorial. This is the right road today, looking mostly south, up toward the Gifu on the right and the summit of Mount Austin on the left. This photo was taken from the Japanese memorial. Despite being bombed, shelled, and under constant attack, the Japanese and the Gifu resisted all attempts to dislodge them. While the 1st and 3rd Battalions, 132nd, continued their frontal assaults, the Army released the 2nd Battalion, 132nd, from reserve to begin a flanking movement to the east around the Japanese position. They progressed to a point just south of Hill 27 where they bivouacked for the night. Snipers from the Gifu harassed them, but they took no casualties. The next day, January 2nd, they moved up and occupied the undefended hill. This is an aerial photo of the area around the Gifu. 2nd Battalion, 132nd, moved up the right road to Hill 11 during the night of December 31st and January 1st. The next day, they moved to a point just below Hill 27. This is an aerial photo of the Gifu nestled between Hills 27 and 31. The hills that comprise Seahorse are in the foreground. The day 2nd Battalion, 132nd, occupied Hill 27, the Japanese tried to push them off five times. The Americans repulsed them each time but moved off the hill to a more easily defended position during the night. The next morning, they reoccupied the hill unopposed and extended their perimeter, eventually encircling the Japanese and preventing the Gifu from being resupplied. This is Hill 27 in 2015. We climbed up the north side. The Gifu is behind us. Except for the worn path, this is how it looked in January 1943. On January 10, 1943, the 132nd Infantry was relieved by the 35th Infantry, who continued the assault against the Japanese dug in at the Gifu. The Gifu finally cracked on January 22nd when the Americans finished the right road and were able to bring up three tanks to the battle. Although two of the tanks got bogged down in wet condition, one tank successfully attacked and pierced the Gifu's perimeter on the northeast front, continued through to the perimeter on the south side, turned around and came back. During this foray, the tanks destroyed eight pillboxes from point-blank range. The Japanese were nearly finished. The Japanese had no anti-tank weapons to stop this armored attack. The tank broke the deadlock. 
This is a schematic of a Stuart light tank. There were four crew, commander, gunner, driver, and assistant driver. Its main gun was a 37 millimeter gun. It also was equipped with three 30 caliber machine guns. That night, on January 22nd, only 89 men of the original battalion of about 800 men were physically capable to have a muster. They decided they could not withdraw despite orders to do so and would not consider surrender. Instead, they charged the strongest part of the American lines where all but four were killed. I will continue the history of these battles in the last of these lectures, Part 5 of the Land Battles of Guadalcanal.